yes, I'm an artist, among other things, but perhaps, interestingly for some of you guys, um, I have in the past had my own businesses in the kind of, the kind of marketing and design arena and started my life after art college um, as a designer. So there's a kind of mixed understanding of, of art, of commercial art, uh, something of business and um, appreciation perhaps of whatever we do, um, if we don't make a profit, we don't survive. Um, so kind of making art work within those kind of confines is always, I suspect, a very interesting area. Um, I had a while when I had an arts review on the BBC and programme which was quite interesting because I got to meet lots of fascinating people out in the out in the provinces and, um, and, and learn an awful lot about their needs and expectations and, and the pains they went through both creatively and, and practically um, with their painting. And um, these days I do lots of sort of demonstrations and workshops and help kind of creative people and creative businesses to um, what I describe as behave themselves, which is, which is always interesting. So, um, I've got a very good experience of a lot of your your customers in terms of the kind of mature market through the demonstrations and I, I talk to a lot of those people, I, I, I demonstrate to a lot of those people and I, um, I do workshops with a lot of those people. I work with students um, and I work from time to time with, with uh, professional artists. So hopefully tonight I can give you a fairly good grounding of the kind of audiences out there that you need to be talking to to keep your businesses exciting. and. Um, in a way in which we can talk about Kryler and how that fits within your your portfolio, if you like, of, um, of paints. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to paint this, this is Patrick, um, who spoke to us earlier on. He agreed to be the victim tonight, very bravely, um, and I'm actually going to I'm actually going to paint on top of it. Um, it's not the first time I've painted a CEO. I've done a few CEOs in business in my time. Um, always an interesting exercise, predominantly men. And the interesting thing when you paint a CEO is nearly always the first pose they'll adopt is this. Because <laughs> it's really important to look like you've killed people to be successful <laughs> on your journey to the top. And the, and the other thing I've noticed is men are so much more vain than women. I mean, they just leave women standing when it comes to vanity. And it's always the men that will say things to me like, can you get rid of that mould? <laughs> and, and, and I normally say something like, can you imagine if I was painting President Gorbachev? And he said, can you get rid of that red bit on top of my head? Because it kind of wouldn't be him. That's what he owns. In fact, you don't need much else other than that. And you've defined him. So, men... And the way in which they approach things when it comes to a portrait, incredible. I painted once the, um, it was actually the um, uh, managing director of Christie's um, some time ago now. And um, I, it was a big, big portrait. I was quite nervous about it because it was the first time I'd ever painted anybody who was somebody in the, uh, in the world of art. And so I was expecting the kind of worst, I suppose, when I unveiled the picture. And I decided... Um, for whatever reason, to unveil it at an exhibition that I was in and asked his permission, and he came along with his wife to see his, his portrait. And um, he stood there looking at it, and he just went silent. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever done commissions for anybody before, but it's terrifying, absolutely terrifying, because you're convinced they're not going to like them. It's kind of like the whole thing about, you know, my wife and her dress. She gets a new dress and says to me, what do you think of this dress? And I go, I really like it. And she said, no, you don't. You're just saying that. <laughs> so whatever happens when you present a portrait, you're expecting somebody to kind of go, no, I hate it. And even if they like it, you're prepared not to believe them. So this guy turned up and he, he stared at this picture for a while and it, it was getting more and more unnerving as time went on. And he said to me, um, he said, that's okay. He said, I'll pay for that. But first can you take the bags out from underneath my eyes? <laughs> and his wife, who was there, she said, darling, you've got huge bags under your eyes. And then he said, and while we're on, he said, how about taking some of that white out of my hair? 
So what this guy was doing was he was asking me to make him look 10 years younger than he really was. And then the best bit about it was he said to me, and he said to me, now, the most important thing is, he said, if anybody ever asks, it wasn't me that commissioned this portrait, it was me mother. <laughs> so I went for six months before I could bring myself to make those changes to that picture because it wasn't right, in my view. But then I got so broke. <laughs> <laughs> Needs be that I had to do it, and I changed it together. But I mean, that's very typical of the kind of thing you find with, with people in business, strong personalities who are kind of being painted for something that sits on a, on a boardroom wall. However, Patrick's been much more gentle than that with me. He's kind of just left me to get on with it, and um, we've done the best we can. Now, um, just before I do um, um, talk about this a bit more, uh, get on with the painting, I just want to say um, a little bit of something about the kind of people I talk to who you actually um, um, look after as your customers, many of you. One of the interesting things I've found about working with, with Kryler um, today is um, that I've learned something. I've learned something about the way in which it can be used, I've learned that I can do an awful lot more with it than I ever imagined because I was put in the kind of position where I needed to do that. Working large like this is quite scary because it's pretty damn obvious if it all goes wrong. You won't see me for dust if it does. But you have to crack different ways of doing things. And I was very fortunate to work with, with our chemist at, um, at Taylor Rowney, who's an awesome gentleman if ever you want to go and talk to him about what he doesn't seem to know about paint isn't worth knowing. Um, and he's been a great help to me, and um, I've managed to conquer new ways of doing things, which I'm going to show you perhaps some of those uh, tonight. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, when I'm teaching, when I'm doing demonstrations, which I do all over the country, um, I've always got these kind of audiences of mainly mature artists, but every now and again I get students, people from art college who, who pop in there. And they are desperate to learn something. They are absolutely desperate for knowledge. And they will eat knowledge up. Why? Because for many people, it's a point in time in their life where they don't have perhaps the years to evolve that some younger people might have. So therefore, they want to get there quickly. And because they want to get there quickly, they want to know all about the stuff you're talking about. And if you tell them something new, if you give them something they could go away and use, they will do it. But what, what, what there is is a big vacuum out there for people who kind of only get to hear what their current tutor tells them. And if their current tutor is somebody who has kind of been doing the same kind of thing for an awful lot of years, that's kind of the extent to which they will pick up new techniques, new, new information about paint. So, Kryler, if you market it properly, which is what the guys are doing, and if when the customers come into the shop, they can they can learn something about it, they will buy it and they will use it with enthusiasm. Because this stuff really actually does what it says, horrible pun, really does what it says on the tube. Right? I was thinking of selling that strap line to the guys, but I'm told it's gone. Um, it really does do it. And um, it, 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 in the first instance, it's absolutely super to use in terms of its, its texture. You put it onto the canvas and what you put on stays there. One of the most irritating things you can have as an artist, the two most irritating things for me with paint is one is you put something on that's textured and you turn around and you do something back, do something else, you come back and it's all drooped. It's, it's lost its brush marks. And the other thing is that I, I've always detested about um, um, acrylics in the past is the color change. You put, you put something on Particularly if you're working with subtle colours, you're trying to paint flesh. You want to retain the subtleness between two colours. That's what gives you a particular impression at a particular point in time. And you put something on that looks right, you turn around, when you come back again, it's two shades darker than it was. So consequently, it makes it really different. It's like playing chess, if it's, if it's important to you to do that. This stuff doesn't do that. It gets the colour that you put on and it dries in such a way that you can be confident you're not going to have to rethink what you're doing so that's a fantastic achievement as far as i'm uh, concerned 
the texture itself when it comes out the tube, I will just, it, it, these guys at Daily Roundy describe it as, as buttery, I'll describe it as sexy, <laughs> right? Because when it comes out, it just says, use me. There's something about being an artist where you've got to be turned on by your materials. And this stuff is just fantastic when it does that. You've got loads more colours in the range. I don't know whether you're all aware of that, but lots more colours in the range. Um, we've got something that works really well as a glaze in, with thin paint, which I'm going to show you. It works really well as impasto, as thick paint, which I'm also going to show you. Um, and all in all, I can't praise it highly enough without sounding like I'm being paid. <laughs> It comes in all these pots. I don't know, have you seen the pots that this stuff comes in? Oh, there they are. I've got, I've got some over here. These things are brilliant. They're kind of big squidgy things, and you turn them up like that, and you get this lovely big dollop of paint that comes out. Brilliant. Okay, really useful. Much more practical than, than tubes if you go through as much paint as I do. Sorry, Evie, I've spoiled your nice display there. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about the paints, but what I want to do is I want to... Um, I want to get on and do some, do some uh, painting for you. This is some paint I, I mixed up earlier, which is a kind of a, a flesh tint. And I'm about to turn that into a glaze and just go over some of the black and white areas on the If you get a chance, come and look at this later, because what you will see on this painting is you will see thin paint, you will see thick paint, you will see textured paint, and you will see lots of, actually, from what you're sitting, it probably looks quite realistic. Actually, if you come up to it, you'll see it's quite painterly. There's lots of movement and marks and stuff all over it. And that's what this paint allows you to do. Um, and if you then work with the uh, retarders, this kind of stuff, which stops it from drying so quickly, and, and adds some of the kind of glaze medium to it, and lots of tricks I've been taught from my chemist friend over there, um, you can really make this paint work for some time. So I'm just going to give a nice big dollop of that. This stuff people don't know enough about. They don't realise just the extent of the properties this has got. This, well, well it, it's, it's, it's actually slow drying gel, but I, I can use it as a glaze medium as well, and it slows, and I can put loads on without any water. And the thing is, on this painting, I've already gone through four tubes of this. Think of the profit. <laughs> right, you see that Patrick's looking sort of semi-happy in this picture. I promise to come back and paint him with a big smile next year if you all buy lots of crow. <laughs> okay, let me find my, my mix, mix this up. How many of you paint? How many painters have we got here? <laughs> Do you get to spend much time with your customers who paint? Do you? Yeah? Talk to them a lot? Do you ever go, do you ever go to any of these kind of demonstrations and things they do? Yeah. You know, there's always, every town seems to have two or three societies. Take some of this stuff along, let them play with it, they'll love it. Right, um, now I need a brush. Go for a big brush. So all I'm going to do in the first place, I'm going to take this, and very bravely, I'm going to give uh, Patrick a tan. You see, this is just thin paint. It's not only going on beautifully, but it's also leaving the underpainting to show through, which is what it is that I want to achieve. And if I dare say it, this has qualities of oil paints, which is not something I ever thought I'd say about um, acrylics, to be honest. I 
I have to keep standing back because I haven't got a clue what I'm doing when I'm close up. Here it goes. And I'm just keeping this stuff really thin. Now this is a bit boring for you this bit because I'm just going to continue doing the same thing. So I'll tell you another CEO story. <coughs> this was, um, I painted somebody who was, um, is quite well known. I'm not prepared to reveal who because as the story goes, you will see why. Um, but this guy was horrible to me. He, he, the portrait was commissioned for a boardroom and it was commissioned by the rest of the board and this particular person clearly had no interest in the arts, had very little interest in being painted and when I bowled up he made me feel very uncomfortable. He kept tutting all the time, and when I wasn't happy with the pose, and I was wanting to try a few things, and he kept looking at his watch. And I had, I had three sittings with him, and each one I dreaded. And I, I actually came to the conclusion that he could sense my uncomfortableness, and he was kind of taking a perverse pleasure in it. Anyway, so I did the painting, delivered the painting, but, when it was at the stage, before this, it was just a drawing on the canvas, I wrote a message on the canvas. And it, I can't actually say what it said, but it was not very nice. It had a few expletives in it and everything I thought about this man. I let it dry and, and painted it. Left the painting there and thought to myself, do you know what, if I'm really lucky, one day somebody might x-ray that painting. <laughs> And his cover will be blown. Right. Is he looking like he's got a healthy complexion at the minute or a bit ghostly? It's like you're making them up. A bit what? It's like you're putting his makeup on. Okay. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you one of the other things that I think is a complete um, fallacy. I think I, I, I've tried some of the uh, competitor paints. I've tried Winter and Newton. I've tried Golden. Um, and I've tried Liquitex. But to be honest, I've tried most things over the years. Um, and I noticed that at the minute, I think it's um, Winter and Newton who are doing this thing about. 10% more drying time on a picture, you know, because with, with acrylics, it is one of those things that um, we would often like a bit more drying time to let us work, work the paint. And they're, they're claiming 10% more, which I find extraordinary, because at the end of the day, 10% is absolutely useless. It's no good whatsoever to an artist having another temp. If they said something like, well, I'll give you another 100% of the time, you know, double the time it stays, it stays wet or more, then that might be interesting. But 10% doesn't get you anywhere. Whereas what I've found is by using a combination of things from Dela, that I think I've got beyond that 10% to a point where I can see a manageable and marked difference in the drying times. I actually think our chemist over there should be writing a book. Note takers. Right, sorry about this, this is all a bit dull, this bit. Repetitive paint injury. Are you all getting fed? <laughs> I'll paint quicker then, I'm starving. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, it's funny listening to um, talking about opportunities for art and opportunities to get people into art and get people to 
to do things. I've always kind of felt that education, or a lot of education, has the, the opposite approach. It stifles that kind of taking the opportunity. And I think the great thing about being creative in any shape or form, whether that's entrepreneurially creative or whether it's in a conventional sense, creativity creates opportunities to do with your personality, to do with the way you think about things, to do with the people you meet and how they view you. But the question is, do you have the confidence or maybe the rashness is a better way to describe it, to take those opportunities up. And I've always, always had a, a difficulty in life saying no to opportunities. And it reminds me of a, a very true story. Of a lot of years ago, I, I was running a business and... Um, For once, I was doing quite well and making some money and decided to get my own back on the bankers by actually putting my account out for tender because I had the kind of account that people would, would go for, which I did. And my bank, my, my business bank, found out about this. And um, this is a painting story by the end, by the way, but I'll get there at the end. They found out about this and decided that the best way to get me back into the fold to take me to the annual bankers do at the Grosvenor, which consisted of a lot of people eating food and getting drunk and behaving like drunk rugby players, um, being rude to the waitresses and, um, and heckling the people on stage. And the person that was on stage talking was actually Roy Hattersley. I'm sure many of you will, re will remember him. And um, the table I was on was with some very senior bankers from NatWest. And they were exceptionally rude towards um, Mr. Hattersley. So I decided to do the bit for the working man, or the man in the business, and told them that they didn't understand what it was like for people to be in business. They didn't understand what it was like to try and run a business and take opportunities but not be able to because you didn't know whether your bank were going to support you or pull the plug and that they were all two-faced one minute they were nice to you when you've got money and the minute you're not doing so well they turn on you so i kind of did me bit it all got a bit unpleasant i ended up having a row with a guy who it turned out was quite senior at natwest and um, we had to be separated. It nearly turned into a fisticuffs. Anyway, um, a couple of days later, I got a call from my then bank manager to say, you've really upset this guy. Um, and he wants to know if you want to come and be a bank manager at NatWest. <laughs> so of course, my creative naughtiness kicked in. I said, try and stop me. So off I went to be a bank manager at NatWest. On the last day of my time there, I went to see a very famous racehorse trainer based up near a place called Royston. And um, during the course of the day, he was told that I wasn't a proper bank manager, which he thought was hysterical. He and I got on really well. I invited myself for lunch along with my bank manager, who was with me, and we got steaming drunk. Halfway through, this guy with his horse, this racehorse trainer, turned to me and said, I think you should have a racehorse. And I said, I can't afford a racehorse. He said, I've got a perfect racehorse for you. He said, the owners have gone bankrupt. He said, I just want a few quid for it. He said, it'll be great for you. So I said, how? He said, 30,000 pounds. I said, you must be joking. <laughs> he went, all right, 15. I went, I'm not doing 15. And he went, 10. I went, I'm not doing 10. I can't afford a racehorse. And then I thought, very mischievously, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll swap you a portrait of your wife. And he went, <coughs> stuck his hand out. Right? So it was a kind of man thing. I shook his hand and that was it. I owned a racehorse. 
We, we, I, I'd ring my wife, I've got on the way home, drunk, going, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> we had two wins with Frankie Dottori on that horse. So there you go. And all it cost me was a portrait. So it just shows you, you see. Now, that's the boring bit out of the way. I've just about done... all the skin tones. So if you can see that, that that's gone on beautifully, smoothly, it's created flesh, the colours I've used there are based on the flesh tone of Kryla and I've tinted it a little bit. I've used some of the medium mix to give us that sense of uh, um, transparency and having put it on top we've already started to get a picture that looks like it's got flesh. It was that simple. Now, that's all very thin paint. What I've now got to do is just to add in a few areas to, to bring up the... the darker areas and bring a bit of colour in. And what I can do here is grab these... These are, um, these are Kryler brushes. Um, I presume you you all stock these. Uh, they're very good. Now, what I want to do now is to do a bit of. Um, bit of tinting around the face, around the, the darker areas, and then I'll put some thicker paint on. interesting thing about this with a lot of the people that I'm, I, I work with, you know, I've told you about the guys that are hungry, but, you know, the kind of mature uh, students who are hungry for this kind of knowledge. But there's those other people, if you take somebody who goes from that amateur to professional status, one of the important things you'll find is an awful lot of people work to a process. They have this kind of way of working that goes through a series of stages to create their picture. And the interesting thing is if you become a part of that process with some product, then it becomes integral, not just to the painting they're doing, but to their attitude, to the way in which they look at their work and their confidence. So again, being able to talk and understand processes and where paints fit into that is tremendously valuable when looking to get loyalty, which is what you all want, isn't it? Loyalty and spending more from your customers. Right, let's do, let's do some highlights I think first, then we'll do the other bits. Right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some, um, some lighter paint and I'm going to put this on in, as, as impasto, in other words, thick paint without any um, medium in it. Again, here's another little trick that by taking the gel, putting the thick paint on, and using the gel to soften the edges, you can control so much of what you put on. So that's 
some thicker paint there, creating a highlight that we're starting to build into his face. I can do the same in a number of other places here. Here. So this becomes very, very workable paint, which is quite unusual, again, for a conventional acrylics. Right, what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to get some white and I'm going to put some real textured stuff on the hair. And what I suggest you all do a bit, a bit later on, once I've finished, I'll hang about here. If anybody wants to come and talk to me about the paint and how it works and how I've done things on this, I'll be here to talk to you, okay? Do you all stock cotton wool buds? Sorry? How many of you stock cotton wool buds in your art shops? None of you. I can't believe it. Half the world uses cotton wool buds in their painting when you don't stock them. And you should be stocking Johnson's, just to let you know, because they sponsor me. <laughs> You think that's a joke, but several years ago I wrote to them telling them I was telling everybody I talked to about cotton wool buds and Johnson's and how these don't bend and they don't unravel and they're brilliant for painting. I got a phone call from my wife to say there's a lorry outside. <laughs> they're unloading a pallet load. I must have got a million cotton wool buds in my house. So it just shows you, they do sponsor me, you need to start stocking them because they're invaluable. Right. What I'm 
I've done here is, as you'll see a bit later on, I've put some really thick textured paint on the hair. And you'll see how it stayed exactly as I put it on there, which is a great part of the paint because that's what I want. I want texture when I need texture. I want thinness and transparency when I want that. And I also want smoothness when I'm looking for that. This gives me all of those things. What I'm going to do now is um, um, we'll do Patrick's eye very quickly. Then I think I'll let you go. Okay guys, I think I've probably done enough for one, for one night to show you just how magic these things are. We've gone from a black and white painting to something that looks a little bit more flesh-like and realistic. It's taken, what, 20 minutes, half an hour? Um, yes, there's technique in there, but what's really important is the flexibility that's in these paints allows me to work thin, transparent, it allows me to work thick, it allows me to work smooth, it allows me to work textured. And because of that, I can take a picture like that, do a few brush strokes, and it will bring it to life. Okay? Thank you. about this or the paints or customers or any way I can help, I'm here, once I've got a drink. Highlights. Your highlights? Yes. Where do you want his highlights? On the left. On the left of his face. Not the left. <laughs> oh. Oh. I will to finish it. Go on, go for it. You want me to do it now? No, no. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just would like to say, in fact, I am not a CEO. You are a model. Yes. <laughs> you want to be promoted? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. 